Hey guys, Compulsion84 here with something a little different. So I thought about doing a kind of question and answer, you know, viewer comment response type thing for a little while, and I just got a question that I think warranted a more elaborate response. So here we go. So I don't know what I'm gonna call this segment yet. I got a couple ideas. I've got Compulsion's Corner, Converse with Compulsion, Connect with Compulsion, Contact Compulsion, Collaborate with Compulsion, and Communicate. Then I've got some other ones that I thought were kind of funny, but not actually good. You know, I, I liked collude a lot, but it sounded like we were doing something bad, as well as conspire or consort. So those were three of the most fun ones, but they had the worst connotations. So I don't know, I thought compulsions, con yeah. I thought compulsions corner or contact compulsion were the best, whatever. Let me know uh, which one you like, comments, whatever. So anyways, I got a comment from Ed Stallion asking about AR-15s. Specifically, he mentioned three budget ARs, that uh, two of which I wasn't really familiar with. So I've got mine here, my three gun one that I use most often as a kind of talking point for a few of the features. And I'll just kind of run through the three that he mentioned. First off, I have to say thanks for the compliment on my videos. I really appreciate it. So it sounds like you're looking for a more budget themed ARs, which is the Ruger AR-556 which I'd never even heard about, the Smith & Wesson AR-15 MP Sport 2, I'd heard the Sport 1 but not the Sport 2, and finally the FN-15 Series Carbine. So I pulled all three of these up. To be brutally honest, I'm not as familiar with some of these, some of these guns, especially the AR-556 and FN-15 Series. I had looked at buying an MP Sport 2 myself during one of the panics, but uh, you know, between having to wait in line at like 3 in the morning and having a couple features that I really wanted kind of stripped off, that led me not to buy one. Uh, as far as the MMP Sports, I haven't heard anything bad about them. They're just very kind of uh, plain Jane, simple ARs. There's no bells and whistles. You know, you take them out to the range and they go boom. What I'll do is I just kind of pulled up each of these and there's, you know, a few major features. I'll just kind of run through each of them. I've got a screen cap going on that may help. I might throw up a picture or two. I really don't know how this is going to go when I edit it. I'm just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. So I'll start off with the core of the whole gun, which is the barrel. So all three of these guns have a barrel length, which is around 16 inches long. You know, they're probably of similar quality. For exact accuracy at this price point, I can't imagine there's going to be a huge difference between all of them. I mean, the one thing that did jump out at me when I was looking at the barrels was the twist rate. I personally prefer, I think a 1 to 8 is the best of both worlds. 1 to 9 is a little bit loose if you want to shoot heavy projectiles. And 1 to 7 can be a little bit aggressive if you're going to shoot some of the lighter 55 grain stuff, which I personally use a lot with XM193. So I did notice the Ruger AR556 had the 1 to 8 twist rate barrel, which in, again, in my opinion, is the best of both worlds. It gives you a little bit more aggressive twist in the event that you need a larger bullet, but uh, it's not going to overly twist some of the lighter bullet weights. Now again, if you're gonna be shooting exclusively super heavy bullets, especially in like kind of single shot mode, going with a one to seven barrel might be good for you. But uh, if you're not doing that, I see no issue with one to eight. Again, one to seven is all right, which the MMP 15 has, which I can't find it right here. So the Smith & Wesson website actually didn't list the twist rate. I had to look it up real quick. But it does say, according to an external article, with a 1 to 9 twist barrel, which is a little bit looser. And then if you jump to the FN15, it's a 1 to 7 twist. So it gets to what you're looking for. Now, the one thing that I will kind of gripe about with all of these is that they're not free floating. I personally think that free floating is, is just the best as far as accuracy goes. All three of these guns do have a fixed front sight post. So if you want to co-witness, that's great. If you're going to do an actual optics, like a magnified optic, you might want uh, maybe to look for one without a fr fixed front sight post, or you might have to raise it up enough so you're not seeing the thing. Personally, I don't like to see a front sight post when I'm using a magnified optic. Now, if you're using like, I don't know, an ACOG or a red dot, you might not mind co-witnessing, but personally, it's not my cup of tea. So so that's something I would say to be aware of is depending what your your uh, optic sight choice, whatever it's going to be, just think about that and the front sight posts and everything like that. The other thing I'll bring up when I'm talking about sights is the FN15 has the, I'm going to call it older style carry weight sight. Now that is completely removable, can't block the mic. The other guns have a similar kind of flat top, which the FN15 does as well. However, it has the carry handle sight. The the Ruger 5.56 and the Smith & Wesson MP15 both have the simple, I'm gonna call backup sights, flip up sights that are, you know, usually around 
But finally, the one thing I'll point out with barrels is the Ruger uses a chromoly steel barrel, so there's no lining, it's just straight metal, which isn't necessarily a bad thing at all. The Smith & Wesson does the same type of thing, listing a, if I could find it in this damn website, yeah, 4140 steel. It doesn't list it as chromed on the website, it lists it as a chromed firing pin, so I believe you're talking a bare metal barrel. Versus the FN has a chrome lined barrel for extended service life. Now this gets into a whole debate that I can't conclusively state one way or another. Some people say chrome lining is better, some people say it hurts accuracy. It's kind of a rat's nest in my opinion. Chrome lining does make it a little bit easier to clean, theoretically reduces pitting and all this other stuff, but when that lining, at least theoretically, depending on your round count, starts to wear away, you may suffer with accuracy. The one I've got here is a stainless steel. Some of my other ARs, I don't think I have anything with chrome lining. It's all, you know, chrome alley vanadium steel of varying grades depending on how much I spent on the gun. So I wouldn't, if, if that's really important to you or based on your research you find that a really important feature, it looks like the FN15 is your choice for a chrome lined barrel. The next thing I'll talk about is triggers, which are really, really important. Um, I When I started saving up some money, started buying some Geisley triggers. Uh, I found that a lot of stock AR-15 triggers just weren't very good to be honest. Some of them were gritty, had a lot of creep, just all the bad things about triggers. Some of my guns had those. Um, I did some PSA or Palmetto State Armory builds and I used some of their triggers. One was good, one was just absolute garbage. So again, a trigger is a really easy thing to upgrade because you just, you know, pull out a couple of pins and drop them in. Some are adjustable with set screws if you want that kind of precision. Some of them are just literally drop in, no adjustments. You get a single stage or two stage break weight depending on what you prefer. So if you do eventually, you know, maybe have some more money, want to upgrade your trigger, that's an easy upgrade you can do. Now talking about the triggers that come with these guns, uh, in general, this Ruger website, as far as the information available, is way better than the Smith & Wesson and the MMP. The Smith & Wesson web website, yeah, the Smith & Wesson posting is kind of garbage. The MMP is not much better. The Ruger one, I could find everything I needed to, you know, communicate information for this video clearly presented and it didn't leave me guessing or Googling and hoping somebody just put the right information up there. So anyways, <laughs> all three of these guns, as far as I can tell, because again, it's not listed by the MSRP or by the manufacturer, are single stage triggers. They're all, I would assume, similar weights. I, they, none of them are advertising what None of them are advertising what the pull weight is for the trigger, which, again, if you want single stage, that's fine, that's typical. For a carbine like this, it's, uh, it's single stage is usually fine. If you want to get some sort of dual stage or three gun trigger, they're available. This one right here uses the Geisley three gun, which means that you pull it with one clean break, but then the reset is shorter, so for those double taps, those follow up shots, you're not going as far out. But again, it's a single stage, but it's kind of a modified, and then like for my Long range AR, I've got a dual stage that's really absurdly light. It's like, I don't know, a pound and a half or two pounds, and then it breaks out under a pound. It's got a, it's got a clean transition past the first stage to a hard stop, and then you gently pull, and then it fires. It's hard to figure out exactly what you're looking for based on a simple comment, but triggers can be really important. If you have a large store nearby, like maybe a Bass Pro, Cabela's, uh, Gander Mountain, one of those, they might have some of these. I would say go try the triggers. If you can do a side by side, that would be ideal. If not, a trigger feel, especially if you don't have the money to update to a higher quality one, can be really important because nobody likes shooting a gun with a super gritty crap trigger. So I would say if you can actually try any of these, that'd be really good. And the next best thing would be if, if anyone has a side by side comparison to trigger pull or just you know their their subjective opinion on what feels better, you know, sometimes you do the best you can with what you have. So let's see. So I hit the barrel. I've hit the trigger. Lower and upper receivers are all pretty much the same thing. I mean, they're all, what, 7075 aluminum. They're anodized. Let's see. They've got a rail. I mean, I'd be incredibly surprised. Yeah, so the Smith is 775 T6. The FN is made of a mystery alloy because they don't advertise it. And the Ruger, who I'm sure has it perfectly advertised, is again the 775 T6 aluminum. You know, you got your upper receiver, your lower receiver, they're almost always black, and these guns, all three of these look to be the same. So when you talk about the receiver, the only thing I can think of is that it's metal and not polymer. People do sell those. These all look standard. I can't say anything is remarkable about any of the three companies. You know, the next thing you jump into is the buttstock. All these have what I'm going to call the classic M4 style buttstock, which is 
it looks like they're usually six position. So let's see, which they all again look the same. So the stocks should be identical. They've all got the typical castle nuts. They didn't mention if they were staked or not. Blocked my mic again. If you're not familiar with staking, that's where you actually hammer the metal over so it doesn't move, but it is a destructive process. Some people do it with castle nuts or with uh, Allen keys on the bolt carrier group. I don't think either are necessary. If you're not going into crazy hard combat, which you obviously won't be doing, it just destroy it just damages the gun and sometimes you have to, you know, machine it off or just it's it's not a good idea. So yeah, in the event that one of these things stakes the castle nut, <laughs> go for that if that's your thing. But I, I strongly discourage it. So magazines are obviously replaceable. The FN comes with a crappy GI mag. The SNW and the Ruger come with a good old Magpul 30 round P mag, which I like a lot. Um, I'd also say for magazines, check out the Lancer AWMs. I personally like those because they have steel feed lips embedded in polymer. They have steel feed lips embedded in a polymer frame. So I think those are uh, those are a really good mix. Again, there's at this point so many reliable magazines, but I think all steel or all aluminum mags are just not very good. But again, that's partially personal preference. All right, I think I'm most of the way done with the rifle. Handguard, that's the next thing. So I talked about free floating before. All of these come with a non free floating handguard. So in the event that you want to use it for accuracy, it's not going to be ideal. Now, if you just want to go out, plank, have fun, learn the platform, there's nothing wrong with a, um, I'm going to say, fixed handguard. But just, just so you're aware, if you do want to be more accurate, it might be worth it to maybe save up money for a couple more weeks or a couple more months and get a free floating gun. So that, you know, when I hold this handguard, I'm not touching my barrel. I am firmly fixed to my upper receiver, which is a better method. You can't argue that it's not. It is a little bit more expensive and it does change your handguard options. So just uh, be aware of that. But as far as handguards go, they're all just the, I'm going to call the classic M4 style. It looks like the FN style is a little bit shorter, a little bit stubbier. The SNW and the Ruger look like they're a little bit longer. Again, if you have these in person, they may feel marginally different. The handguards are replaceable in all these guns. So the FN15 and the SNW both use, you know, the standard handguards that are two pieces. The one thing Ruger did advertise, and it's hard to say if this is a marketing ploy or not, you'll have to double check. They mentioned the, I think, one man removable handguard. Yeah, one person handguard removal and in installation, which if you've ever done this before, you have to kind of use a tool, squeeze it, push down, and then pull the halves out. And it actually create, takes a reasonable amount of force, and you really do need two people to do it. So it sounds like that Ruger has used, it says, patent, ah, patent pending barrel nut and delta ring. The barrel nut's what you use to actually affix the barrel to the upper receiver. You know, it's not shown. In here, you'll have either a standard one, which a lot of guns use, or a specialized one, which is often, you know, split or tweaked in some way. So it sounds like Ruger has used a proprietary one that's supposed to make taking off the delta ring and removing the handguards easier. So again, if you want to swap this out, it makes it a little easier. Maybe you don't need the tool. It sounds like you don't need a, any special tools. But that's, that's if you're going to mod it. If you're going to mod it, it's irrelevant. Front sight post, they're all... All these front sight posts, as far as I could set, tell, are fixed front sights. There's nothing special about those. You can get into the gas blocks. I don't remember if these are any different. So the when you talk about gas blocks, which if you're not familiar with it, which lives underneath here, is what actually vents the gas from your barrel back into the action and makes direct impingement work. So gas blocks are really not fancy at all. What really matters in most cases is if you need to get fancy, you can get an adjustable one. It doesn't matter here though. So with a rifle length gas system, it's all the way out here. Mid is a little bit closer and carbine is a little bit closer than that. So as far as I can tell, all three of these have an M4 carbine gas system. I personally prefer a little bit further out one because it makes it a little bit easier shooting. Uh, and I think easier to handle for follow-up shots, but again, it doesn't sound like you have much of a choice. SNW15 doesn't advertise anything, neither does the FN. The Ruger explicitly says that it's a gas block that's M4 position, and they talk about optimal balance and handling. So it's all, it's again, they're, they're all on the same page. And then finally, the last major feature, assuming I didn't forget anything, is the you know, compensator, flash suppressor, whatever you want to call it. So Ruger uses some Ruger branded flash suppressor. It looks similar to an A2 birdcage. 
far as I can tell from the pictures, because their listing is so bad, the Smith & Wesson uses a standard A2 birdcage brake, and the FN looks like another, it actually says A2 style compensator, which is nicknamed the birdcage. So those are okay, uh, nothing fancy at all. So these, um, the, the flash suppressor on guns that are illegal in most states that aren't pinned or welded is you can actually remove this by just unscrewing it. And it's a, a standard off the shelf part, so a standard wrench will allow you to take these things on and off. And I personally have the Miklet compensator because it was like $37 and it does a pretty good job. Um, again, it's louder, but it controls rise better. But there's there's dozens, if not hundred, hundreds options out there. So that gets into a whole discussion I can't really touch. But again, all three of these guns have removable compensators and they're all essentially the same from the factory. I think I've covered all the major facets of these guns. Um, you know, all the guts and the lower parts kits are pretty much the same from manufacturer to manufacturer. Hmm. I don't think I missed anything. These all seem to have, I'm going to call standard charging handles. Again, if you want to get a little fancy, you can get an extended latch or you can get, you can get like a BCM or something fancier. If you want you make to chart, if you want to make your charging handle, you know, zazzed up. Hmm, is there anything else I'm forgetting? They all have the same removable grip. I like the Hogue one. I think it's more comfortable. Just a, a flathead screwdriver in here. They're all the same in that regard. Ultimately, what I'll say to condense down however long this video ends up being is I would say uh, they're almost identical. These, these cl three guns are clearly tied to the same budget level. They're trying to get entry-level shooters or people that don't want to spend a lot of money or want an extra or whatever the reason is. So I'll say the following couple things that, um, you know, things that came through my mind if I was going to buy one of these, these uh, budget ones, what I would run through. So Ruger has been making ARs for a little while. That's by no means their primary business. They don't really have any government contracts. At least I'm not aware of any. Um, they did the mini whole Mini 14 thing, which kind of crashed and burned. Uh, S and W, these are very common. They make a lot of guns. Um, Smith and Wesson's quality is decent. I, I don't have anything notable to say about them. I've used some of their guns. They work fine. I have a shield. It works. The MMP pistols work fine. I mean, I would say their quality is you know average. The one thing I will mention is FN uh, does have a lot of military contracts. They undercut Colt and got a tremendous amount of business. So I think they've made a they've made an outrageous amount of money in U.S. government contracts. So this is something that you'll have to dig a little bit deeper into, but if you're talking about overall quality, if you look into some of these parts, you might find that some of these are military overrun parts. So in that case, you might find, find that these parts are, you know, of a certain quality and FN has a certain expertise. So if FN is making, you know, millions of ARs a year, they know how to put these things together. They know, they know what they're doing. And especially if they're using, you know, the same old parts the military uses, which doesn't inherently mean, you know, that they're super fancy, but they might work. They might be slightly better quality. So that's just something that, again, that's that's purely uh, speculation, but it could be that the FN rifle might be a little bit better built, maybe a little bit better parts. They might just know what they're doing a little bit more. Again, you're going to have to do just like a little bit of digging, kind of find out, you know, I think this all comes down to build quality. That's my, that, that's my, <laughs> condensing that to 30 seconds. They're all about the same price. They seem to have very similar features. The Ruger seems to have a couple things they did right. Uh, Ruger, some people like Ruger, some people don't. I'm not going to get into that. I do like the the barrel twist rate being a little bit smaller. Uh, the interesting handguard could theoretically be good, but if you start swapping out parts, you may need to get a new barrel nut, which will cost you, I think they cost ten or twenty dollars. Uh, what else? Yeah, I mean. You're not going to be you're not going to be breaking the breaking the bank with any of these. I would honestly say if there happens to be a gun show, store, etc., with a big sale nearby, uh, whatever is if something is significantly cheaper, you can kind of go with any of these. These are all in the category where there's nothing di differentiating between any of them. Um, again, I would check the quality, do some research, find out what people say. I guarantee you'll be, you'll be able to find uh, side by sides of at least two of these guns, if not all three. Because they're all, you know, hitting that niche. Um, the one piece of advice I would say is if there's a specific upgrade that you want to do, like for example, you want a nicer barrel, a I don't know, a free-floating handguard or something like that, a nicer trigger. 
uh, maybe think of that right out the gate because if you're gonna you know buy a rifle and then buy like a new handguard for example you're, you're immediately shelling out an extra hundred or two hundred dollars uh, you might be able to find one off the shelf that was a little bit uh, more expensive but came with what you need and ultimately you're not wasting it I mean I've got two or three handguards sitting around or I've given away or whatever so that's uh, that's my advice for any AR builder is just try to think one step ahead um, Again, based on your, everybody's situation is different, but based on your budget, if you if you really want one feature, maybe save up just a little bit longer and get a rifle with that one feature. But uh, I don't think you're going to be really hurting with any of these. They should all come out, go boom. You know, you can get experience with the platform. In all honesty, my first one I bought for about twelve hundred dollars. I didn't really know what I was doing. If I were to do it again, I would have bought something slightly different. So getting this. Getting one of these at like, I don't know, 600 to 800 bucks might be a really good learning experience for you. You might be able to get one, find out exactly what you like, don't like, what you want to do. You see other people on the range, all the doodads, you know, bells, whistles, can openers you can stick on these things. And then you can either mod your existing gun or just buy a whole new one. And you could either, you know, again, I don't know anything about your situation, you know, sell the one, keep it as a backup, something for your friends to use at the range, whatever. But you'll, a lot of this just comes with experience and again I'm just I'm just a guy that likes to go shooting and uh, you know I've got I don't know I've been shooting since I was in grade school in varying levels but uh, really to get familiar with a platform like the AR where there's so much variability so many features so many modifications you just gotta find out exactly what you want and I don't think you can really do that without either experiencing it through other people's guns or experiencing it through your own so this wow I haven't cut this yet and it's 33 minutes so hopefully it gets a hell of a lot shorter. If not, maybe I'll leave it long. I really don't know what's going to happen if you wanted a video anywhere this long. I definitely didn't intend for it to be this long, but it just kind of happened. So, um, Ed, I hope you find this helpful. I, again, not intimately familiar with any of these things, but I am, I would say, fairly familiar with the platform. So hopefully this helps you out and, uh, you know, helps you make a, a good decision. I would say if none of the stores near you, have any of these things keep an eye out for online sales from some of the big uh, the big gun stores I like grab a gun personally and I've had really good luck with them uh, you might be able to save a lot of money and again if you if these are all $800 and you can get one for like 700 you might just want to pick that one up so I'll quit rambling at this point uh, the usual outro is I'm from Paul's 84 I like to make gun gaming and gadget videos Been doing a lot of gaming here's a gun one I gotta balance it out a little bit so there's some videos over um, my right, stage left, stage right, whatever. There's stuff over here. Click on it if you want. If you liked it, subscribe, comment, whatever. This is an experimental format. Let me know. Constructive criticism, please. I'd really prefer if you didn't tear me apart. It hurts my feelings. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, if you enjoyed it, please subscribe. As always, thanks for watching.